Um, and, and what we hope what we hope to do today is um, end up having a dialogue with these experts to help educate us in front of the public on their various ideas and thoughts about the property tax. As you know, we've had hearings around the boroughs and we've heard from the public. Um, and we all understand this is an incredibly complicated issue um, in New York City and in New York State. Um, and we take our jobs very seriously, but in order to get to the next level, we want to have a dialogue and a discussion with some of the experts in New York City and New York State on the property tax. And so we've invited these guests to, to be here. So I'd like to start on my right and have the members introduce themselves. I think you hit the red button that oh, gets recorded. Yeah. Jacques Gia, New York City Commissioner of Finance. Ray Majeski, Deputy Director, Chief Economist, City Council Finance. Francesco Brindisi, representing the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Alan Capelli, City Planning Commissioner and uh, Property uh, Class 1 homeowner. Uh, Vicki Bean, I'm a law professor at NYU Law School and uh, one of the faculty directors at the Furman Center. But there's a wall between that part of the Furman Center and me um, on these matters. I will be trying to shut it down. <laughs> um, Carol O'Clarica. James Parrott. I'm Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Elizabeth Velez, Commissioner. Gary Rodney, Commissioner. And now we'll have um, the panelists introduce themselves. Chuck Brescher, uh, former research director at the Citizens Budget Commission. Uh, Anna Champany, director of city studies at the CDC. Uh, Moses Gates, uh, vice president for housing and neighborhood planning at Regional Plan Association, class two renter, but with full Article 11 property tax abatement. <laughs> uh, Mark Willis, NYU Furman Center, sen senior policy fellow. George Sweeting, Deputy Director of Independent Budget Office and a Class 1 property owner. Okay, so um, I, think, I think the easiest thing would be for us to start asking, unless you guys wa want to have some opening statements, we'll just start a dialogue if that's okay with everybody. Could, could I just say that I think everyone here has read your work and the, and the testimony you submitted, so... You ought to know that that's where we're starting. Right. And that's why we have questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I think we should say that um, we've relied heavily on the work that you all have done over many decades on this issue, and um, both analyzing and explaining and recommending it, and we very much appreciate that. Um, so maybe, maybe um, we could start there um, in that each of you, uh, well, IBO, Furman Center, and CDC have made very specific recommendations about ways in which um, the property tax uh, could be reformed. Um, but as, for example, the IBO's, um, not yesterday's report, but the report before that um, uh, indicated there are you know, different priorities that one could have. Um, so one, pri one set of priorities would be reducing any disparities between class one homeowners. Um, another set of priorities would be reducing disparities between renters and homeowners. Um, and there are other priorities, of course, as well. And so I wondered if you all could give us a, uh, an assessment of where you think the priorities really should be in terms of reform. Uh, thank you. And thank you for taking the time to uh, consider our testimony that we submitted. Um, I think there, um, we feel that addressing the disparities is sort of a, an important issue, both within class and across classes. Um, as we noted, um, there are substantial inequities and in tax burdens that are resulting from tax caps um, on the ass uh, assessment increases that really favor a certain set of neighborhoods in the city and that those need to be um, addressed uh, or should be addressed through the reform, uh, but we also say that the disparities between the classes really need to be narrowed, that there are definitely policy reasons for which the city may choose to have a lower effective tax rate 
uh, for homeowners or for other types of properties, but that the current disparity is really too broad um, and puts a substantial burden on the commercial and rental properties. Um, thank you. First, I would like to correct. I have the full Article 11 tax exemption, not abatement. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, in addition to kind of supporting the broad reforms in terms of residential property taxation and balancing Class 1 and Class 2, there's a couple of other priorities that um, we'd like Council to consider. Um, the first one is that you know, looking at rectifying inequities within just the New York City property tax system might lead to different outcomes than looking at other types of inequities that result from property ownership and how it's affected in income taxation federally or on the state level overall. The example I'm thinking about is uh, many residents, um, and I use the Article 11 exemption as an example, in public housing or in uh, subsidized housing might not pay indirectly New York City property taxes, um, but they still don't benefit from uh, things that class one owners benefit from in terms of a mortgage interest deduction or property tax reduction on their income taxes in terms of other systems. Uh, so I'd encourage uh, the commission to look at the <coughs> overall inequities between homeowners, renters, subsidized renters in a, in a larger context uh, than just the New York City tax system, even though you know we understand you're only charged with rec making recommendations to the tax system. The other uh, discrepancy I think that the council should look at is encouraging resident occupancy. Uh, not necessarily just owner occupancy, but resident occupancy. Um, and looking at different taxation systems between uh, investment properties, whether that's a large or a small investment property, and you know many one to three family homes are used as investment properties, co-ops and condos, um, uh, and second home ownership. So those are two kind of broad categories in addition to what I would say are or consensus things. Like and, and you think those issues should be handled through how the property tax itself works or by having some sort of um, relationships with uh, regard to other taxes that are paid by those individuals? I mean, in an ideal world, I think we should look at a broad array. I under, you know, <coughs> the commission is charged with looking at the New York City property taxation <coughs> system. Um, and so I think that there's also ways to address it within that system, yes. That's a little. That's a little vague. Could you yep. could you be a little more specific? Um, certainly. So, in looking at class two reform, oh, are we on? Uh, so, in looking at class two reform, um, you know, there's an idea of if you lower the property taxes for multifamily class two buildings, how will you ensure that tenants benefit from that directly? Mm -hmm. um, and right. there's there's right. many I right. So there's many ideas, rebates, things like that. There's a question whether, say, a resident of public housing or a resident of subsidized housing should be eligible for X dollars or X percent rebate on their income taxes if their building is not paying income taxes. Um, I would argue that because those residents don't benefit from other systems, such as the mortgage interest deduction or the property tax deduction on, on federal income taxes, that the commission can take the opportunity through the through the New York City tax system or through any proposals to also rectify that instead of just <laughs> saying these people are out of the property tax it's system. Coming out of New York City revenue. Or New York State revenue if that happens to be a possibility, Chef. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> something for earned income tax credit or the personal income tax? I mean, you know, you've just talked about a couple of it couple of benefits that people receive because of home ownership on the income tax, and then we have benefits that go to folks whose income, low-income households already who are working via the ITC, a very effective program. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, should we be looking at that angle rather than as a property tax issue? I mean, I would suggest you can look at both of them, and it really depends on the scope that the commission wants to, to work within in terms of proposed reforms. Um, you know, the other example I would say in terms of uh, uh, investment properties is, is to look at a bifurcated system for one to three family properties in which there's some form of resident occupancy or owner occupancy credit for those. Um, and that can be done through the, through the New York City property tax system. 
Uh, one uh, <laughs> bit further. I, I don't know if you've written some of this down. I saw your broader thing, but I don't know if you parsed mm -hmm. out or cost it out, um, whether you have an empirical foundation for some of these proposals. But I was going to ask anyway, um, do we know at the moment, do we have any concept, because I know economists have not parsed out the incident, we do mm -hmm. not know how much of the property taxes passed from landlords to tenants. Correct. Right? Do you have any idea? Do you know any empirical work? Could you help us in any <laughs> way? Because it's something that we've all been puzzling over. We're in search of the any empirical work or even a well-based rule of thumb uh, grounded in something. I will, I will turn this over to, to experts. Thank you, George. I'm, I'm not going to claim expertise on this, but I, I'd suggest w one way of, of at least th that of thinking about it that doesn't actually depend on empirical work is to think about the role of the of, uh, when, when the rent guidelines board sets their their rate each year one of the factors that's taken into consideration when they do their owner's cost um, index is the change in the class two property tax burden and you know our office actually prepares that analysis for them now obviously the recommendation from the staff is not always what the final, what, what the board itself adopts, but when they're setting the rate, the, the rent uh, guidelines increase, they've reflected upon that, and it, to some extent it's built into it. I'd also note that in, cl in class four, I know most of the attention here is class two, but in class four, you know, an awful lot of commercial leases have a tax escalation clause built in so that yeah. the um, you know, mo most, if not all, of the uh, tax increase uh, year to year gets passed through to the to the tenants. Yeah, of the commercial and buildings. and class four is more complicated because there are owners and there are out of state people and whatever. But yeah. two, I was really yeah. trying to focus on. Yeah. And on, I, I would just two. add, you know, if we're but you're talking about marginal changes, changes right, right. Uh, George? And so yeah. we don't really know <laughs> what's built in to start with, is that correct? That, that's correct, I mean, our, our rule of thumb is 25%. Your rule of thumb is 25%. <laughs> Grounded uh, for in what something. It, for, for what it's worth. Okay. <laughs> may, may I comment on it? So, uh, I, oh, you're, sorry. You're missing George from the panel, so I, I know you guys oh. might, but can we, we don't <laughs> want no, that's good. to miss George. Uh, no, so, we don't want to. Uh, might, uh, might break the camera. No, no, can, <laughs> we can move him down just a little bit. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. I'm sorry. I have no idea where the camera is. It's right there. No, no, but right. I don't know where yeah. he needs to be. Is that better? Better. Thank you very much. Mark. Sorry. Okay, no, uh, certainly. So, like every question, it's complicated, right? So, I, w I would say um, it's <coughs> so there's rent stabilized, and we can talk about that, um, and we should separately uh, add some more to what George has said. And then there's the unstabilized, uh, what we call market rate stock. And there is, an, and here's an economist, right? Is the short run and the long run. I can assure you, in the short run, in the market rate uh, rental stock, that no landlord will lower their rents as a result of a yeah. decrease in property taxes. Yeah. So that is the flip side of your question. Now, in the long run, no. right? That, so there's no in immediate incidence effect. In, in, the, in that market. The, the hope is, and why economists always talk about that, having a fair system um, is uh, the relative use of land for residential versus non-residential. So presumably, if we ended up with, let's say, one class for residential and its tax rate relative to the commercial is stays the same in general, then we would probably not have any major impact on the on how much uh, residential property we have. I mean, the danger is if you raise it in uh, our, um, you, you raise in the taxes in class one and you r reduce them in class two, the combination of those two is what's the residential class and how would that, its overall tax rate compared to uh, the non-residential part. Um, with the idea that the allocation of land and resources would eventually adjust to whatever changes. Mark, can you just now, give us context of um, the proportion, proportions of 
rental stock that's stabilized versus it, it, you know, It's easiest to think about it just in general. Uh, Three million units of housing, one million uh, is home ownership, one million, uh, the other two are rental, and they're about evenly split between rent Thank stabilized you. and non-stabilized. Thank you, Mark. Mark, let's make this really hard for you, okay? Um, we building a whole lot of class one right now? Uh, no. Um, um, yet it has an advantageous tax rate. Yeah, no, right. I mean, my take on it is once you get land use in there, I don't know how much play the tax system has on it, on what we build and how we build. Associates. Well, if you talk to a, a, some in the real estate industry, they would tell you uh, that um, condos were setting the price of land a few years ago. That I'd right? accept. And, and it's, you know, that part of the market softened, and, and people said it was almost impossible to do rental fraud. But that's right? within within areas that would be, I mean, as my understanding is land use rules for condos and large class, and class two rentals are effectively the same. So that's within the bounds of land use rules that the differentials affect. You know, the, the question is, you know, the question for everyone, just to put it another way, yeah. is if we change property, if we make the property tax system fairer, do we get more rental housing built? And if we get more rental housing built, does that mean rents go lower? So, so Ray, uh, so here's another aspect of the whole I issue, which is the market out there has adjun uh, adjusted to the property tax system we have now. So we call that path determinacy. Right? And uh, if you change the relative taxation of residential versus um, uh, commercial or non-residential use, you could affect ultimately the, the allocation of land between those two pieces. I don't see anything that would change that. Yeah, there has to be a belief. There has to be a belief that the change is going to be long-lasting enough to have those impacts. Well, no, that's right. So there's the long term and the short term. Right. Um, you know, uh, with some controversy in my testimony, I, I said, you know, if, if we want to go to a different system here, and I think there are, uh, there are, are reforms that make a lot of sense for fairness, transparency, um, economic efficiency, wh whatever, uh, uh, we should move in that direction, but we should go very slowly because the market will could get very disrupted if we really change dramatically in a short period of time here. Um, and you'd have to believe, back to Carol's question, the long-term efficiency gains, long-term benefits to tenants, for example, if that's what we did, uh, are worth it. Um, but you know, so take your time, take your time getting there. And one of the complexities, of course, in terms of the long-term effect is that uh, pro the property tax, any property tax reforms would also take place against a backdrop of 421A coming mm -hmm. back up for renewal, and, and that certainly affects the picture in terms of what gets built, right? right. Mm -hmm. So we wonder if you all have any ideas about how to deal with that interaction between 421A and the regular property tax system, everything else in the property tax system. <clears throat> given the, you know. Well, so, so if we were just talking about um, 421A and mm -hmm. getting rid of it, for example, or phasing it out, um, it could be very disruptive, again, to land prices. So you've got two, these are really two different pieces of how you can really affect the relative price or the prices that uh, developers are willing to pay uh, for the thing. And just so we understand, <coughs> if you increase it, taxes, and the economics in the building don't work anymore, you know, some people say, well, they'll just raise the rents. Well, no, you won't raise the rents. If, if we're talking about market rate apartments, they're already charging as much as they can. So, um, you know, if you, you want to do both things at the same time, you'd have to look at separately how, how to phase those in um, to do that because each of them on their own are going to affect property prices. That is both the change in the property tax system and in the exemptions offered under 421A. Sorry. Uh, I, I would, but the, the other, presumably any um, major reform uh, that you, you could complete is going to involve some kind of equalization between the class two burden and the class one burden. So 
Okay. If class two is coming down, um, you know the some of the, uh, the 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 need for the tax incentive in 421A may may become yeah. less, yeah. Um, and that sh that should give you that might give you some room to work out the these uh, balancing act that you need to do as you as you're uh, addressing both of those issues, and it also you know conceivably at least on if you changed um, 421A going forward, you've got some some uh, resources there that could go into the pot that uh, helps create your revenue neutrality that you're you know, aiming to achieve. I mean, I think we were going to echo a lot of what George had said that the um, you know, a lot of the exemption programs and abatement programs that have been created were created to address the inequities and issues in the current system. Um, and it's really hard to think about how you would change 421A at the same time when you're changing the property tax system or thinking about how to do the reform because you don't know what is sort of the, the remaining um, incentive that you may want to provide for affordable housing. So I think you would need to sort of reconsider yeah. all of these substantial exemption programs, but I think you sort of need to figure out first, like how, what's the property tax system we want, and then what are the remaining sort of hurdles that we feel we need to address, and how do we change the program? There is also the separate question of how do you, you know, 421A, ICAP, these are all long-term benefits. So sort of there is a transition question for the properties that individually have them and, and sort of how do you carry that forward under a new system. So that definitely becomes more complicated. But our, our thinking is that the reforms should address some of the high tax burdens for rental properties to the effect that you don't need as much of a, of a, a, port of a tax incentive program to incentivize the construction compared to condos. <coughs> do, do you guys have a position on who should bear that burden of that change? I mean, at, as it exists right now, I, what I think you're getting at is as it exists right now, 421A is an exemption, and the burden is necessarily borne by essentially other class two properties. No, I'm talking or, about the, 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 the issue of reducing the burden on class two renters. Yeah. Uh, where where does that get paid for in the property tax, assuming we're going to keep to the mayor's desire of keeping this revenue neutral? Yes, and I mean that is that is definitely probably one of the most difficult uh, parts of the charge that you guys have is that you are trying to stay revenue neutral. Um, I think you know we do envision, and our our assumption is that class one taxes would need to go up. That that is the class that has had the most sort of preferential treatment under the current system, and that if you do need to redistribute, that would be the place um, that you would sort of see some of the shift, but you do need to sort of consider the, how you equalize. There would be a lot of movement sort of both within classes and then ac across the classes. Um, there are also questions about valuation, you know, sort of right now we, there's a lot of <coughs> measurement sort of built into how we're valuing the property and you need to start with the right value to really be able to think about what the burden is. It's part of the challenge even now about talking what about the co-op tax burden versus class one because the valuations are done under state law, but yes, they're done in a way that what the value that finance puts on these units is so much lower than what they're selling for and it makes the comparisons hard. So that's one of the reasons why we focused on valuation. You need to start off with a good value that property owners buy is the value of their property and then sort of would need to go from there. Can I just follow up on that, Anna? Um, I mean, one of the things that your um, report indicated is that you're you're deeply suspicious. I think would be the right way to say it about the valuation of Class Four income-producing properties. That you see the sales prices of those properties being much higher than the assumed market value based upon the DOF's valuation. And so I wonder if you could. Um, you know, if you could talk a bit about what improvements you think need to be made on that valuation scheme in order to reduce that disparity. Well, I, I think there are a couple points that we suggest. One is greater transparency in the setting of the capitalization rates, which is what is driving the valuation that the Department of Finance um, has, and sort of for, for better understanding about how those rates are being derived and how they compare 
um, the other piece is too, you know. Is this not all, can I ask mm -hmm. you, is this, is this a fact question? Is this not all on their website? I thought it was. The, the cap rates that they use are reported in the assessment guidelines, but the formula by which they're determining the individual, the, the various cap rates, I mean, they it's like a 40-page document, and they differ based on what type of office building sure. and what neighborhood and this the age, and that. Right. Yeah. So I think, but the underlying pieces that feed into that formula, I think, um, you know, we know what the cap rates are, yes, but how did they come up with an 8% cap rate or whatever it is? And how does that compare to? And and you think property owners don't know that or understand it, and that most of them don't take this already and adjudicate it, so they they somehow get it anyhow. I'm just curious. Well, I th we think that their values are too low, so I don't know that they're necessarily <laughs> complaining. No, no, I I I, I right. no. They are complaining. They are <laughs> complaining. They're, they're still they complaining. complaining and they do know, I didn't I, mean their valuation, <laughs> that they weren't challenging their valuation. I meant that in that process they got all the information as to how th where the cap rate came from and how it was constructed. That's all I meant. Uh, okay, no, I, okay. I, I don't believe that the, like, I mean, the cap rates are published, and those yeah. are, the, I think the department is pretty consistent among using the published cap rates based on the income guidelines, so I don't know how much of the discussion at a particular challenge case revolves around the income versus the cap rate being applied. I'm okay. not sure. I mean, presumably you have access to the data uh, to I look do. at sales and look at what the appraisal, appraisal value was. Um, uh, and a major variant, uh, if there is a variation, there might be the, the cap rate. I, I will comment, in mm -hmm. if I may, just in class two, you know, um, it explains exactly how you do it, and then there's a line that says, and then we make adjustments. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, th I think that's something you all can take uh, a closer look at. I think in, uh, my concern, just because we do a lot of work in affordable housing, is I, I don't really fully understand how they make the adjustments when there are rent restrictions on part of the on, on part of the building and I don't know whether in class four there's sort of a similar line like that but um, I can, can, I can I make one mm -hmm. observation Just, mm -hmm. I, I would be cautious about drawing putting too much weight on the fact that that people protest their properties uh, as evidence yeah. that there's something wrong with the values. Thank um, you. Okay. Thank it's you. totally, <laughs> it's costless. It, it's a comment on the lawyers in right. the city. Yeah. I got right. it. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, the Sorry. driving industry. <laughs> it, it costs the land, the, the owner, nothing to, to protest. And there's not even a risk that they will, yeah. um, that their taxes will be increased. Right. They only can go down. But no, one of the down. one of the things that we've heard though is that one of the things that drives the difference between the sales price on the market and the uh, assess you know the value based upon the cap rates is the court's unwillingness to give DOF much room in terms of the speculative nature yeah, of right. future income. Yeah. Yeah. And I um, first of all, I'm asking, is that your uh, view? Um, but also, is there anything that can be done about that, given that it is, it allegedly is a judicial imp judicially imposed restriction? I mean, I, I think there's the similarly that there are disparities within class one. I think we also have concern that some of these differences within the classes vary. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we were recommending that there be the same sort of class ratio, the sales ratio studies done in class two and class four to be monitoring and ensuring that if there is some particular sort of margin between the sales price, which, which yes, presumably can capture a whole lot besides sort of the, the current income and use of the, of the lot, um, that you're sort of monitoring how broad that is and how much that varies among different neighborhoods or types of property and stuff so that you're at least sort of taking a good look at that on a regular basis. It seems to us that in class one at least, that issue is is almost totally driven by the the caps yes. that yes. are in law. Yeah. Yes, right? no, in, in class one, yeah. yes, but in, in class two and in class four, we the valuations, I think, would benefit from this sort of greater scrutiny. Yes, in class, and in class one, the market values, when you do these, the sales ratio studies, the market values are in fact pretty close to the sales, so that's also kind of, you know, that's how you've got class one, and in class two and four, it's a, it's a different kind of value, and it's just something to sort of be thinking about in terms of 
understanding the relative burden across the properties. So, um, okay, you know, could, Mark, um, could, I, could, oh, I just, sorry. could I just push on this yes, a bit? Because this gets to a, a slightly different issue that was going through my head. Is there then a reason, or might there be a reason for us to look at um, how to distinguish some properties within class four? Should there be uh, some distinction in the property tax between um, class four uh, properties that are in the core of the central mm -hmm. business district versus other class four properties? Or do you assume that that's going to be, that's going to come through in just a market valuation? If it doesn't, is, is, would there be a reason to um, put an extra, uh, cre create a, either a class or a distinction between um, we all we do tr we try to do it with with trophy properties, but there are other kinds of properties that are you know only exist in the core of Manhattan, and they, they don't exist anywhere else uh, globally. They might mm -hmm. in Singapore and a few other places, but they don't exist any place else in the United States realistically. How do we deal? How should we be dealing with that, or how should, or do we care about that? I would argue that if I mean that that should be addressed through the ca the guidelines themselves. I mean, I I think you could you know you you the guidelines look at the the income for the building, you know, the expenses, and then there are you know there are cap rate ranges based on the the type of property it is, which includes location. If the guidelines themselves are properly constructed. I would think that would get much of what you're what you're suggesting. Um, yes, but part of it gets to Vicky's question mm -hmm. about some of that is future oriented and therefore constrained, sure. right, by a judicial although, ruling. Although, in the you know, predicting what neighborhoods are going to be subject to appreciation ten years from now seems like kind of a. I don't know if you'd want to start policy by. Well, you know how we always predict, by, right? Yeah. Forecasting is always based on the past. Right. Forecasting right. doesn't. Um, you know, Long Island much City else. maybe belongs <laughs> in the appreciating. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm just raising yeah. the yeah. question because well, it get, does uh, get to valuation issues. Wait, right. right. So um, I can't uh, opine on the judicial. It, it seems to me it, is that a legislative change you could make to have a judiciary. Um, uh, uh, Criteria is changed. Um, you know, I, I've heard <coughs> that the, the tax court also feels very constrained by what uh, by what's going to happen in the courts, and that seems something well worth understanding a lot better than I do uh, as to whether that's. So uh, I think our current uh, project is complicated enough. We're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it but then raises the question mark about should we be taxing more on a highest and best use as opposed to the current use? Yeah, right. right. And that's a broader policy question. That's Right. Um, <laughs> you want to go on to that topic? We can, <laughs> we can do that. Let, let me just, uh, just uh, because I'm, I'm sure everybody thinks uh, this, uh, so I, maybe uh, uh, it won't uh, be as dramatic, but, you know, mass appraisal is tough, right? I mean, there are ways to appraise individual properties. Uh, that's not a way that this city could function is to probably do that. So you're going to have, uh, you know, some variation here. You, one hopes that the cap rates do reflect what's happening in a neighborhood and in a particular market, and to the extent that they can be more nuanced about that, you ought to be able to capture most of what you're talking about, Carol, obviously not where there's a unique property, no one else. And then, you know, when you're looking at um, income and expense, some buildings are charging at market and some are not there yet because they got long-term leases or something, uh, you know, an appraiser would look at all of that, but I think it's really hard when basically what finance has is just the income and expense piece. So you can say in this neighborhood, uh, properties are valued uh, more at a higher ratio uh, to income because Rents have gone up in that neighborhood. Yeah. You can and say that in general, but you can't. They have it as a snapshot. They right. have it as a snapshot. And in it's time not an individual dated. building. And it's not an individual uh, building. Um, so I, I, I know we have a very sophisticated audience, but it may be worth it uh, just reminding everybody we talk about caps, 
And then we're talking about limits on assessed values going up, and then we talk about cap rates. So we should be really <laughs> careful. That's a totally different. <laughs> to, totally Short different. For capitalization. Right. That's right. That's right. Um, so. Uh, can I, can I follow up on Carol's question a slightly different way? I just wonder whether there aren't some parts of the city that can bear taxes, higher property taxes on them, with less economic effect than others. What I'm thinking of is how much of the value of any property in New York City is a function of its location. You know, my, when I bought my co-op, I paid three times the price of the average home in America for one-third the space. That's not about marble, you know, that's not marble fixtures, there's no gold in the place. That's about the fact I'm in Brooklyn Heights. My friend bought a very similar place, building of similar age, you know, out in, in what's it called, Briarwood, lovely part of Queens, she paid about half. That, once again, is location. So location is some, such a big part of the value but, but, of the city, and Ray, it that matters. That's in the model. Right. Does it right. come the out? The whole point of location, you're saying, is people pay for where they're located. So it, it goes to what people are willing to pay for the rent or pay to buy it. I'm not aware, you know, you, we can sit here and talk about somebody who bought a property 50 years ago when they made all this money and whatever. Uh, the market needs to transact every year, and somebody is going to buy a property based on their estimate of either what they'll sell the units for or what they're going to be able to rent it. And they're going to sit down with what's called a real estate pro forma and figure out how much they can afford um, <coughs> to pay for the property based on their estimate of what the rent is uh, or the income is going to be. And if they don't do it and they're going to go to the bank, the bank will do it for them. So Move you know, to the the ultimately run. the market determines how much they can pay for the property uh, if we're thinking of a vacant lot that's the easiest. But but, but, but but let's move to the long run, right? I mean, you know, when I tax the improvement, right, when I tax building on a plot and how much I tax that, that has an effect on what gets built. When I tax the plot, that has effect on the value of the plot. Let's go for land tax. All right. Well, you got it. Exactly. Let's have a vote here. Who would like but, the land tax from a theoretical point of view? But, you know. Um, Only if the Lincoln Institute does it. Oh. Yeah. Right. But how much of the how much of the value in some of our parts is a land tax, and do we does the effective value of land matter? Does the effective tax rate on land vary among our parts of the city? Is my question. I don't actually know the answer to this. I'm just trying to think about that. And as as one of the reforms in terms of the valuation, changing the model for valuing land as opposed to the improvements on all existing plots, you know, whatever class is something that the commission can look at. And you could, you know, it would be a difficult technically, but you could value land based on essentially residual valuation from improvements. It's, it's a, a change that would, you know, require a headache, but it's something that could be done and built into the system. The, the, the current uh, division between land and improvements is not necessarily rational. No. Now, just to be exactly. clear, yeah. so uh, Moses is saying you'd have to start from scratch to do these valuations because no one's ever cared about it. It, 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 it wasn't important. It, it, the total price is what mattered. It, it's not only is it not rational, it's actually random. I mean, you can, you can, go, to, you can go to the same tax block and find the, lot, you know, the lots with the percentage of the value that's being <coughs> ascribed to land versus the building changes lot to lot. Not, uh, not everywhere, but there are parts of the city where that's true. And that, that's something the city, I don't, that's not tax reform, that's tax administration. Well, yeah, cer certain members of the City Planning Commission may differ on the randomness. <laughs> 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 but, but the point is, it's, you know, like in any other system, it doesn't matter what the division is the way we do taxes here. It only matters if you think you're going to look at that data and try and decide what a land value tax would look like. <coughs> the warning here is just don't do that. <laughs> but there are places that um, penalize, through the property tax system, penalize vacant land, leaving land vacant. Mm -hmm, right. Right. And in a housing crisis, there might be some rational approach to that. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. There might be. Yeah. Yeah. There might be. What would that be? <laughs> I mean, the, and the question. I mean, the question with that is, you know, there's a continuum from, you know, there is a dirt plot with nothing on it to there's a one-story taxpayer, you know, to there's a parking lot right. to there's a one-story taxpayer to there's underzoned. 
Uh, and, you know, does you apply that and you move up the continuum becomes more and more disruptive. And I think the question is, you know, right now, d- correct me if I'm wrong, we call vacant land essentially nothing is built on it except a parking lot or other kind of surface uses. Um, and if you want to, you know, call that vacant land and have a tax on that, that's, a, that's different from, you know, yeah. dialing that up to underutilized land. Uh, um, Vicki asked about highest and best use. So uh, the, the current system is if you have uh, you know, two buildings on the same street, uh, look exactly the same at street level, uh, whether that's commercial, whatever, one goes up four stories, one goes up the full zoning, eight stories, yeah. does it make sense to tax them both the same? Right? What is the incentive? What are you creating by doing that? So one of the benefits of the way we do it now is we actually look at what the in- income is there. So we're not saying the four-story building needs to be torn down or that we're going to make it uneconomic because it's not an eight-story building. It's allowed to exist and continue. You tax at highest and best use, you're going to, you know, when you're talking about vacant land, that's fine. You want it fully developed. But we got a lot of, you know, land that's already developed here. And how do you want to treat two buildings next to each other that are of a different size? Do you want to, should they both pay the same property tax? Um, Sorry, we don't have all the answers. Some systems do both. They, you know, if, you do, if you're not paying an income tax, you can do it separately. But the problem is it is tied to income. So at some point, you have to get somebody to report their income. And, and you right. do that with a delay. You know, <coughs> income taxes for this year gets reported next year. And is that going to determine what I paid for taxes this year? Or am I going to use it, you know, with a one-year lag for, for my ne- next year? Th- those are the complications there. You should ask Jock this, but I, I, I would th- doing it through the income tax system is a lot simpler. That's one thing. It has an administrative simplicity. I think that's why most states do it that way because you're already reporting your income there. It can all be dealt with through a credit. Again, I don't want to speak for the tax commissioner here. But um, but you, you also I, – I don't think you have a choice between the two for people who don't have – file an income tax. Um, you, you need to provide some other – other way for them to get it. So, um, and how the state income tax system or city income tax system reports to the property tax and gets that information back and forth, you know, it's a bit complicated. But it's all doable. Other states do it, and they do it both ways. We've got enough coverage that we could make changes that. I think that's the issue. That's the issue. We've got, you know, the, the amount we owe on each one of those things, the annual debt service is small relative to the flow, so we could make changes that would do that. I think that the issue with me on doing this besides tax administration is that old thing, salience. 
what do the taxpayers know and will treat mm -hmm. as being given property tax break? You know, I mean, I worry sometimes when we do things on personal income tax that are about the property tax, mm -hmm. people see what you, see the property tax and treat it as a separate issue from the income tax and, shall we say, don't necessarily give hmm, elected officials the credit for what they're doing when they're giving the break. See, but I, I, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. Right. I mean, in, in terms of the property tax break, I mean, I think one of the, the prior questions that needs to you know, you, I'd suggest you think about is, you know, exactly how much broad relief do you need in class one? Um, we have a system now that's incredibly inefficient in order to provide protection against rapid increases in class one, class one the burdens, the caps, the, caps, the yeah. assessment caps. Um, you know, that gives benefits. There, there's obviously no means testing there. It also allows a sub, you know, the next owner inherits all of the, uh, the accumulated benefit. Um, you know, so we, we are, we are well, using. Right, exactly. In fact, we're, we're almost unique, at least according to the data you, I can find at the Lincoln Land Institute, um, in, in not resetting uh, the assessed value at the time of sale. Um, so right now, we're right now we're giving very expensive, broad relief. And a question, it seems to me, would be, you know, how much relief, wh what exactly is the relief you want to give? And then you can think about the different mechanisms of doing it. Some of it can be just the, the um, you know, you could enhance the current senior citizen and, right. and uh, disabled and veterans exemption. Working in income would be a little harder. Um, or you can you can beef up the, the circuit breakers that are available, um, but uh, they can be, that can be much more targeted than what we're currently doing. Yes, and 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 everything we can do there is wonderful. And we're in class one, and we're dealing with a whole bunch of people. And then I'm going to go back to that million mm -hmm. renters yeah. who are in a the free market, as yeah. Mark Willis mm -hmm. described it, mm -hmm. right? And how on earth do we bring justice to those two? different groups well, together uh, so, across so, so, them. So, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I mean, some jurisdictions just um, impute a certain percent of rent is called taxes. And then, and then you go through the same circuit breaker kind of analysis. And so if 20% of your rent exceeds some percent of your income, then you qualify for the circuit breaker. And we can use his rule of thumb, or we can try to support some other rule of thumb. Yeah, well, I don't, right. Empirically. Now, this would you just arbitrate, my choice of term, you just pick an arbitrary amount of relief. Well, somebody's going to pick whatever doesn't cost enough, right. so much but money yeah, that right. it breaks the bank. Right, right. I mean, I mean most circuit breakers are very small. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and New York State, in fact, has a renter circuit right. breaker right. for the city that assumes 15.75. I have no idea where that <laughs> one, but, right. uh, but that, so, I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of using the income taxes. A, you have all of the income data. There is already, you know, there are a couple state programs. They are, in, in fact, very small. The benefit is very modest, but it would be a lot easier to piggyback on those um, than it would be to try to sort of do this, bringing the income data into the property tax and then doing the credit and the, the Department of Finance does it for the senior citizens, homeowner exemptions, and others. But it's an incredibly time-intensive process if you now want to expand that to a much broader set of households. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits of doing it as a circuit breaker, as a standalone through the income tax. But I think there, you know, one of the, the possibilities is to do a homeowner, a homestead exemption. And one of the things that that would allow you to do is to offer a, a reduction. It doesn't have to be as substantial for primary full year residents in the city and differentiate those properties from class one properties, co-ops, and condos that may still be held for investment use. So not every class one property is owner occupied. So you could in fact mix the two to do some benefit for primary resident owner occupied homes and then do a target break, a circuit breaker on top of that to really target the relief to those who are most burdened by the, the taxes uh, based on their income. And, and we do already have a de facto yeah. homestead exemption on the co-ops and condos through the abatement, and it should be, you know, not difficult to expand that to other class two renters and class one homeowners. Well, I think and we also have the star. I mean, the star. Yeah. The star is the one that does it. Yeah. 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 
It's a lot bigger primarily yeah. Yeah. now, yeah. but I think it's a lot harder to do the renters. I think to yeah. you know right. you if you if you send relief to property tax relief to renter buildings through the the property tax system, then the question is, does it ultimately get to the renter? Which is why I think the places that have a benefit for renters tend to do it outside of the. Although the I would yeah, right. Yeah. I, I That's would a very good point. Yeah. I, I would add that it, I mean, I don't. There would be a lot of challenges doing it, but if you did want to do it through the property tax, the star, um, I'm sorry, the co-op condo abatement offers an example in that if your co-op, the co-op handles the application for the building and for the, the qualified tenants mm -hmm. in the building, and they get a check from the Department of Finance, it's their obligation to get it to the, the uh, qualifying uh, owners within the building, and there's actually a $10,000 fine to each me for every member of the board if it can be shown that they didn't give the money to the, uh, the appropriate people. <laughs> so, so Ray, I want to go. Schedule, schedule. Ray, I want to go back to your question because I thought you might also be alluding to another issue here, which is, if you provide a circuit breaker which uh, eliminates taxes uh, through credit or, or otherwise, a hundred percent of the taxes above what is considered the allowed level. So you shouldn't be paying more than, if you're earning less than twenty thousand, you shouldn't be paying more than five percent of your income towards. Um, uh, property taxes, whether that's an owner or a, a renter, um, basic structure here, uh, you do raise the risk that uh, no one's going to worry about what their property taxes are. So if you want more awareness, there might be some sharing of, of that above 5%. So I see you nodding, and uh, it's just something to keep in mind here in terms of actual design. I mean, there, there are a lot of the other, there are, I mean, designing a circuit breaker is, is very complicated, and there are other features so that sometimes those percents that you rebate decrease as you go up in income, for example, mm -hmm. or there in most jurisdictions there is a cap so that you, your rebate can't exceed a certain amount. So there are other ways to address some of this, too. So it's not, you know, everything over a certain amount, which is based. And um, so I have um, two questions to follow up on that. One is that um, are you seeing a homestead exemption or a circuit breaker or, or some combination thereof as addressing both the question of people who are low income, senior, fixed income, ve veterans, et cetera, and people who are house rich but cash poor when market values go up? Or are you seeing that even with a circuit breaker, a homestead exemption, et cetera, you'd still need, I get all the problems with caps, but some system of phasing in market appreciation changes? I mean, yeah, we, we had suggested that there be some mod phase in a, a three year is what we had suggested, mm -hmm. so that there is some slight, you know, smoothing of the ups and downs. Um, well, should we care about that for higher income people? That's one question, right? Yeah. So there's, you know, you get hit with a higher market value this year, um, but your higher income, is it still something that we should be concerned about? I, I don't see why there's not a reason why we couldn't do both. I mean, the argument for having a homestead exemption for higher income people is that absentee ownership contributes to our housing crisis at no matter what income level it's at, essentially. Um, you know, if you have a homestead exemption and you tax absentee, you know, pedetaires or absentee uh, residents, you know, that's also a way of, of getting housing back on the market and, and kind of moving towards solving the housing crisis overall, and I think that's the the rationale behind that. I think in addition to that, you can also do another income-based circuit breaker program um, to emphasize it also through the same mechanism or a, or a different mechanism, whichever whichever one works the best. Um, no, I, um, the, the advantage of a uh, homestead exemption more generally, because we've sort of slipped into that for a second, is the, the, the product tax system to, uh, now is totally impenetrable. Mm -hmm. It's totally, totally impenetrable. Yeah. No one knows what their assessment is. No one knows what their value of their property is. 
Correct. You know, so it would be, you know, it would be helpful if everybody saw uh, more clearly, because I think in most cases it's, there is something there on your tax uh, thing that says this is the value. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to tax homeowners or renters or, you know, or rental properties less, you could have an across the board, uh, or within those categories, across the board, uh, homestead exemption. But then people would see that, that I'm getting a benefit here, they, uh, and they could compare it to, you know, here, here, here's the benchmark I understand, which is my market value. So, uh, Well, can I push on that salience point for a minute, Anna? Yeah, I mean, also, I mean, again, it's also about <coughs> how one does an exemption, because there are, the homestead exemptions are sometimes a percentage, sometimes they can be a flat amount, and that does, in fact, have a different effect mm -hmm. depending oh, yeah. on the value yeah. of, the, of the property, yeah. so that mm -hmm. is definitely something that, if you're exempting just li the way STAR does, just the first um, some portion of the market value, it's going to have a proportionately smaller benefit for those who own high value properties. Mm -hmm. But there's still some exemption. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so can I ask on that salience question? I mean, why don't landlords currently tell their tenants how much of their rents is going for taxes? If it's really so high, which we hear all the time, why is it that landlords don't make that clear to their tenants? It makes me suspicious. So uh, it's about 20%, I think, uh, on average. Uh, I remember something that I saw that landlords taxes often are claim 30. No, no, right, but uh, where did I see something like that? Percentage of offers? Yeah. Yes. I want to say yeah. closer to 30. Well, yeah, even if it's 30, yeah. right. Maybe they don't say that. Yeah. 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 And it just raises the question, what's the other cost I'm paying for? I, yeah. You know, I think you're getting... Mm -hmm. It, it, uh, it, uh, landlords maybe uh, I have no idea, but maybe concerned about getting into that whole discussion about should the well, city should, should, prefer should my rent that? be determined by what your costs are? Well, no, well, that's not how rents are determined. Well, but sh should the city prefer that? It would make the fact of property taxes much more salient to renters who are I, I voters. Think, uh, I think the city would be in trouble if it did it with any intention that when they decrease the taxes, the rents would go down. That's I think that's the problem. I mean, I, I would say the answer to the question is, you know, simply landlords don't generally take the opportunity to communicate with tenants, you know, about much of anything if they don't have to. Um, I would say, I mean, follow, I, I think, you know, in terms of some kind of rebate, there's, there's a few mechanisms you could follow. You could do it through the income tax system, in which case, you know, you need people to file their incomes. You could follow a co-op and condo model where you give the rebate to the building owner and inform the tenants your landlord has gotten X amount of money in a property tax rebate. You are owed some portion of this but money, that's, and that, that's a massive there you go. mailing. That's a massive mm -hmm. mailing. That's a real undertaking. I, I tried I mean, it's, doing it's something like that in Detroit, and let me tell you, it's yeah. very, it's very difficult to mm -hmm. get to tenants, to work around a landlord to get to tenants. It's not easy. I had mm -hmm. proposed in New York City when I was finance commissioner posting this, right? Just having an ordinance yeah. where you had to post in every building this is the property tax that your rent is covering. And it's not transparent. It never went. It never went. All I can tell you is it never went anywhere. Maybe it's a time to make it, to do it, but it's, um, well, this is not easy. <laughs> Administratively, this is yeah, not okay. easy. And I just want to caution people. <laughs> right. <laughs> if I might, a little, something a little different. I'm, I'm, it sounds like everybody mm -hmm. would go for, is advocating a one-class system, is that, or getting rid of our current classes among the property tax? Property, or, or or do we have other ideas? So I don't think we got all the way down the line on that question up front. So <laughs> uh, and I uh, I alluded to it, but not directly. So if we were starting from scratch, probably it would make sense to have one class, maybe two. A lot of places do have a little lower tax rate, effective tax rate, whether it's um, uh, the homestead exemption or otherwise on on residential. Mm -hmm. uh, properties. It's a very different question to ask where we should go from here. Uh, and uh, you know, if you we were back to priorities, uh, I just think the class one inequities within class one and the way co-ops and condos, those are the kind of the most glaring things about 
You know, it's just if we believe people should be taxed based on the value of the property, I think those are where the biggest problems right now are. And then you could start talking about, which is I think your more basic question about class shares, because that's what you would be uh, getting to next. But you know, class one just uh, uh, you know people sense that the, that the system is unfair and inequitable, uh, and it is. Um, that's where I but would start. I, 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 wa I want to push on this because oh, it seems to me there is a logic in distinguishing between income producing properties and non income producing properties. Just as an economist, that to me that's like that's right. different use of property. And now we have a system, I quite agree with you, where there's some bleeding from mm. one to the other. Class two has both income producing and non income producing properties. And I'm beginning to think that with the housing crisis we have and the growth of population that New York City's experienced, we'll also probably have a, f a lot of illegally converted residential properties that are functioning as commercial properties. At least a chunk of that property is commercial. Commercial meaning uh, a multifamily? Somebody's or making, or yeah, income producing. Income Somebody's pro making okay. money. Yeah. Somebody's making Easy money there. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. So that people can have a home. Or exactly. So that you can pack more families in to a limited space. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're, you guys have been looking at this, you're experts. Can you tell us, do you have any estimate as to what, um, what eagle, illegally converted housing there may be here and how, and some suggestion as to how that could be treated in property tax reform. There's one thing we do not want to do as in property tax reform, and that is make affordable housing worse here. Right. That's not our, right? That's absolutely not a person here who wants to do that. And we don't, certainly don't want to do it accidentally either. So the more information we can gather about what the state of class one and class two mm -hmm. housing, what share of that is really being done commercially <coughs> and being done commercially illegally would be very helpful to us because then we'd have a, a, as realistic view as we could of what that housing stock that's being taxed looks like. Go ahead. Uh, no, no. George. This is, I'll, I'll take the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> in, with, within class one, you've got, I mean, there are legal income producing properties. Yeah. You've got right. um, you know, a couple hundred thousand two and three family homes. Yeah. And those are those are producing income and depending on exactly if you if you went to a, a system of non income producing and income producing, you'd, you'd have to wrestle with where you put um, the three. Right, you'd have some judgment right. calls right. to make, correct? Right. It's a substantial part of the housing stock. It is right. I, okay. It, it's but I mean in No, it's, it's something like I, I we the, the data is available. I just can't remember it. And New York's a little bit different than the country, but something like forty percent of the rental stock is in one to fours. Yeah. It yeah. could really benefit from those data. It's easily available. It could really yeah. benefit from uh, okay, as we'll, a, we'll get that to you. As as just a quick rule, it's about one third of class one properties are rented and two thirds are owner occupied and about the reverse for class two properties, about one third owner occupied and about two thirds rented. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, um, but, but the because of the condos right, in class two, because of the condos and co-ops in class two. I mean, so the the point is, you know, ostensibly the purpose of separating class one and class two is provide owner occupants with the benefit, um, and you know, you can see the system as it exists today. It's you know, it it's on stuff. the margins it does, but you know, it really doesn't overall. I mean. Our residential class system is separated by units in building, and I think the commission and you know the public should ask if that's the uh, the best way to bifurcate a residential property tax class. Um, the other quick point I'll make, since nobody has brought it up, and I think it's reasonable consensus, is class three properties are also something you know are also a question that doesn't get addressed here. Um, pay a uh, a very disproportionate burden, and because of the regulated nature of utilities, it's 
uh, you know, very likely that that is just simply passed on to ratepayers in a in a regressive way. Yeah, we're going to operate on that assumption. Absolutely, no, no one here doubts that. Just a fact. But I. Just, oh, I'm sorry. Just a fact that been that Emma sent in to me about half of market rental pro stock in New York City is in Class One. Yes. So Class One is a big part of the market rate rental stocks. Is. But I I want to push back on uh, on. Um, the question about the priorities. Um, I mean, I'm I'm hearing, I think uh, uh, CBC argued that you know the inequities um, between Class One or within Class One um, are a priority. I think you didn't exactly say George, but I take it that that's the argument. Um, Is that right? <laughs> Mark just I, I, said I, I, that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think. I, I pay a lot of attention to the disparities between one and two. Uh, right. And so, uh, you know, in terms of inequities. So than, than inequities within one. Okay. In terms of, of the inequities, um, renters are, by and large, um, a much poorer group than homeowners in general. M many more people of color um, are renters than are homeowners. So why why should the emphasis be on resolving the inequities up within class one as between as opposed to resolving the inequity between renters and homeowners I see immediate benefit in doing in class one and as, as I said before I don't see renters benefiting greatly or at all in the short run and we're now talking the long run is 10 to 20 years so um, I'm all for dealing with this over a long period of time, but I don't, if you went tomorrow and solved whatever you think that disparity is, I don't think it'd make a big difference. And since we just uh, uh, do a little quick advertisement out of the uh, NYU Furman Center, we just did a, a session on rent stabilization and reform and looking at it, um, <coughs> looking at the wonderful work that's done on, on annual cost increases uh, that uh, are found and are published in the Rent Guidelines Board book uh, bear uh, little or no relationship to what, in fact, the Rent Guideline Board gives annually as the increases. So in the rent, uh, if you thought that decreasing property taxes would, in some mechanical way, get passed through to rent-stabilized tenants, maybe that undermines my argument. But I don't see anything now that would m give me comfort that that's actually going to happen either. So I don't think the market rent uh, tenants would benefit and I'm, it's not clear how much the rent stabilized would then would why wouldn't we I'm sorry Go ahead. why wouldn't we also be worried that a renter's tax credit would just allow people to pay higher rents and allow the market to go up right so why why would we be talking about a renter's tax credit if we was are I talking about a renter's tax credit I didn't know that I talked about that you mean beyond the circuit breaker it, it, I, I started from the beginning. It all affects land value. Right. So unless you think that changing the taxes affects the demand for housing and the price of housing and the price of rents, it's all in the land. That's where it will all show up. And so I mean, of course that will happen. I'll go back, Mark, to your, your issue on class one because I'm not sure I understand all of <coughs> the importance of placing on the disparities in class one because within class one, the disparities are almost totally as a result of Tax yeah, right? yeah I, I agree. <coughs> we all know we have to deal with that, but it's also a part of how property tax works to, is to make these kind of changes and have to have a conversation about that. So other, other than you know, the, the comments about a welcome neighbor policy, what else would you do in, to deal with the disparities in class one? I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure what the question the is. Huh? But, but I think I get rid of the caps. I get rid of the caps, and I would phase in to a system without caps over some period of time. Right. Except, remember, the reason we're here is that this this property tax system was created in 1980 that put in place caps to protect people from. Oh no! I'm mean, right. On the, well, right. Uh, on the on the caps, and I think George can speak to this also. I mean, our recommendation is to eliminate the caps upon title transfer and to make. Make it but tight. That, that was and my question. Right, other, and 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 I think that that. <coughs> Why I mean, upon so title I transfer? I mean, then don't. In we order to protect the existing homeowners. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. that that's just 
very rough, that's not even justice, not even rough justice. That's just making <laughs> things even more uneven. Yeah, Privileging the privileged. Yeah. Yeah. Prop 13 doesn't totally have a good random. history here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, or, well, I mean, there's, so prop 13 a, you could, do, the yeah. prop 13, you would have to tighten it up for a loophole yeah. to yeah. preserve yeah. the caps. Yeah. But I think, you know, in the IBO's recent work, they estimated that it's a very small percentage of one to three family homes that are actually benefiting greatly from those from those caps, and they're benefiting disproportionately. And I think that that's the thing that, that this will address. I mean, Joe can speak to it better than I can. They're not, I mean, there's a lot of variation within there about whether they're recent buyers yeah. or right, right, right. Yeah. Because we don't reset, so if you happen to buy a home now in this car slope, you're just getting the benefit that you know that neighborhood has had from rapid appreciation growth. I mean, and I mean, but the, but or I mean, you you were you were suggesting you know the, the caps are there and, and whatever small things we would do, I guess are sort of at the margin. Whereas I think about the caps. Uh, I mean, the caps are they're the roughest of rough justice in an attempt to protect, you know, probably a relatively small number of people who needed protection even back in the 1980s. Um, if 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 what you're protecting them from is rapid appreciation that their incomes can't support, um, so it, I, you know, IBO officially does not make recommendations, but I think some of the things you could think about would be, you know, if you did eliminate the caps, there are these other mechanisms that provide targeted yeah. uh, yeah. relief, yeah, circuit breakers. Uh, the circuit breakers. The homestead exemption, you know, right. provides a little bit of broad relief, but probably not as inefficiently as the as the caps do. Um, so, I mean, I think there are there are paths forward in a world without caps that still give some protection to people who who, who need it. No, no one has mentioned the class share system yeah. issue, which is not only <laughs> close to incomprehensible, but clearly must be generating yeah. part of the equity inequity between classes. problem yeah, right. yeah between yeah. classes right. absolutely yeah. and 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 one of you said the inequity between one and two is an issue more important than within one yeah. but we're we're kind of trying to in answer to Vicky's <laughs> question of priorities which w which would you attack first let's say we don't end up with a one class system but instead mo a more than one class system is there any reason that there'd have to be any um, adjustments of class shares? Can you think of a? Well, um, you wouldn't have class shares. shares. Yeah. By it's definition, you'd, you'd have to. Go away. Do you mean? Well, if you have more than one class, class. you right. have. If you had income producing and versus yes. non-income right. producing, right. let's say. Right. So in theory, you don't have to have class you don't have at all. Right. Well, right. I, I, I'm trying to get somebody more. else to say that yeah. instead no, 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 of my absolutely. saying it. Absolutely. 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 <laughs> you know, I'm, I must admit I'm a little skeptical that we get away from class shares. If we're having the problem of trying to, you know, we match up, we're going to have at least two different ways of assessing property, plus what the hell we do with the utilities, right? The minimum we're going to be assessing properties on income basis, we're going to assess the properties on sales. And there'll be different groups of properties. And we may have, for reasons we've just described about appreciation and speculation, what can be brought into it, we might end up with two very different formulas for what they mean by market value. Once you do that, you probably have two classes. And we may still need to think about how to relate them. I mean, I don't know if it goes away as easily as, as we think. You, you, well, you well, sort of get what I'm saying? The, the question whether the class shares are fixed or move only very slightly, or whether you allow what you can call the class shares to vary based on the relative rise in, in value, whatever method you're using to, to do valuation. But you do need to, at some way or another, relate those two groups and how you tax them. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's sort of, you know, if I'm getting two different formulas, if what, what I use for mark, we still we have the point right now where market values, where market values means different things in a different, each of the classes, very different things in different classes, and within class two means a couple of different things. Um, you know, I think I think that's a way of putting it, and you know, well, I mean, it has a different relationship to the price, the value of a, mar a value of property in a arm's length exchange, and are calculated in different ways, and maybe we do we end up in a system that just has one way of doing that, so we can just put one tax rate on top of everything, 
and say that's it and that's fair. Do we end up that way? I don't know. I'm just, just saying we might end up with more than one. And that was what the mayor said, the homestead exemption allows that to happen. Maybe that's the way we do it, the homestead exemption. I don't know. I mean, that's just, yeah. You supported um, not having a fixed class there or not needing to have a fixed class there. The fact, the reason you have classes is because you want to get a better grade. And if you, and it's not for economic <coughs> reasons of promoting college endowments. You have lower income homes that have to pick up. So even if you have no income, you have other kids and one has investment in housing. Mm -hmm. But you, you, what we said is that that would be a policy flaw. So Mark re referred to the law in uh, 1980 and the S-7000 and what the intention was. And just to make Chuck's point, at that point, the assessment uh, ratio uh, for class one was 18, I think, or 20%. 20? 20, 20, right? And I, I, you know, I did a lot of work, some of you know that, uh, uh, way back then. Um, I don't think anybody there thought it would be six today. And even if you adjust today's and for the higher tax rate, it's really nine right. uh, <coughs> at the official rate. And the actual rate, uh, as Mr. Steve pointed out, is, is well below that. So, you know, if you're, you're going to allow the political system to vary whatever, you, if you have to treat two places differently, whether it's whatever the system is, uh, we can see wh how it will evolve over time. And, um, make your own judgment whether that was a good thing or not. Jay, did you have a question? Um, again, it's on a different topic, but I can't. Yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> given that we've solved everything yeah. on those <laughs> other topics, <laughs> yeah. This is very, uh, this, this is a very good discussion. So let me open another mm -hmm. door. Um, right now, New York City is Straining its ability to tax charitable institutions um, by the Trump, by the state constitution. Um, so I'd like you to suspend reality <laughs> and say, you know, uh, out of fairness uh, or you know some other criteria, we should treat those institutions differently. Um, and. Uh, and then also opine on the issue that if we, if, cha if you think that we should tax them in some way, but we're not going to be able to change the state constitution, what would you suggest the city do to seek some tax payment or some payment from charitable institutions that arguably benefit tremendously from the provision of free services and directly pay very little for that. I, I can start. Go ahead. I mean, I, I think I, I would I would assume that that the state constitution is not going to change, um, and uh, so I think you have to start looking at other other options. Obviously, one is is uh, some pilot payments. Uh, this is actually something that our office. Uh, Includes as one of the budget options that we, we uh, <coughs> suggest every year be considered. Uh, there are, you know, you you could isolate the um, the, the hospital buildings. You could isolate the education uh, buildings. Uh, I think there are variations where you look at just the um, the uh, the buildings that they're using as housing for their faculty and, and uh, staff. Um, so certainly there, there are places where you could identify institutions that you then want to sit down and try to negotiate something with. And lots of other cities do this. 
um, there's some these good work. Referring just to be pilots, which I think is a for pilots. Thing. Yes, not not for taxi, yeah. but for pilots. And, and you're saying you've got some data that can give us some range here. Uh, you know, I think we we uh, actually Anna did, <laughs> did this when she was at IBM. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we we looked at uh, the terms that are used in some of the other cities. Cambridge does it. Um, I believe Providence does it. There. Are the, the roster of cities goes up and down each year. Yeah, uh, so there are there are examples out there. The Lincoln Land Institute again has done uh, some good work on uh, ways of getting at this. Yeah, I mean I, I think we'd like to echo what George yeah. was saying that specifically in, in areas like housing for the medical and, and educational institutions where the the property is an essential part to their charitable mission necessarily that maybe those would be places that there might be some. Uh, some leeway. The pilots are, in fact, I think more, you know, when, when Boston enacted them, they did have, a, I think they did a working group with the, their nonprofit sector, and, and they have, I think, similarly a large. Was it, was it Boston or Cambridge? I think it, I thought it was Cambridge. I think, I think it's Cambridge, but I'm not certain. Okay, I thought. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, m Sorry, more of what government does could be done through user fees, and I yeah. assume yeah. that's also would work. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a proposal a while back that never went anywhere from the sanitation department, for example, to charge nonprofits for their garbage collection. So there are other places like that for the services, but I don't think that that's going to get you the same sort of dollars um, that the pilot is. This issue came up in the 94 property tax commission. Well, we had testimony from, um, from the um, faculty union at at the Brooklyn hearing oh, in yeah, no, 2018. Well, they know where they want that revenue <laughs> to go. And, okay. and right. they have, a, and the, so they have some numbers. So uh, I was there, and I, out of courtesy to Mark, I didn't want to mention so, some. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't speak on behalf of NYU. I just want to be clear. I do have my own opinions about that. It doesn't sound like anybody has an argument against seeking some sort of tax or tax like payment for charitable is that correct well now, now <coughs> you're in the theory of yeah, government yeah, you know yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't know you, you're providing real service so you could argue there and the, the other is uh, you know charitable activities is something government wants to encourage so um, I don't know it seems to me that's not a simple answer to that right and, uh, and again some of it is um, religious property, which gets into yes. other kinds of constitutional right. issues, right. and you don't want to go after necessarily go after that. <laughs> uh, but I think there is, as part of what Mark was referring to, a sort of gray area. I mean, that you're a nonprofit that owns something that's purely for commercial purposes doesn't get that property doesn't get exempt. And I think there are gray areas. I mean, you know, the courts have ruled in favor of saying that providing faculty housing is part of the mission of education. But I think, you know, it, it's in that borderline where you can start to say, well, why are we giving, well, and, and who's benefiting from the exemption? Is it the institution or the tenant? But why are we giving big tax subsidies to otherwise, you know, um, I, I always complained I wasn't paid enough in NYU, but otherwise <laughs> fairly well compensated uh, faculty members and physicians at hospitals because the institution decides to own some housing. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and the hospital issue is, is interesting also just from the perspective of over the next decade or so, <coughs> the pressure to have for-profit hospitals yeah. enter into the New York marketplace right. is going to yeah. re-raise this very issue. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the hospital issue was dealt with in part through the, the community benefit requirements in both federal <coughs> and state <coughs> legislation. I think that's one way to get it back, that they have to do something. But that could use, I think, some improvement in the nature of enforcement and definition as to what those benefits are. And for the record, I'd like to just finish the two public universities that tried to raise the issue. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Any last minute, uh, any final words of wisdom that you think are things that we really should be asking about that we haven't asked about, or that we should be thinking about that we have that we have evidenced no thought on? I, I mean, I think there's I'm another sorry. one other piece to, to think mm -hmm. about from a different point of view, which is that the stability within the property tax and, and the structural features of phasing, and they provide a lot of benefit to the 
renters and owners, they also provide fiscal benefit to the city mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of a very smooth right. uh, revenue stream that has really helped the city weather some recessions and stuff. So, I mean, while you have a, a mandate of being revenue neutral in year one, you ca I, I would also urge you to think about sort of the long-term implications from the city's fiscal health. And Never and said year one. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can I can I push you on that because sure. the IBO produced something actually that showed I think it was Dave Belkin who did it that, <coughs> that the um, we're relying on the property tax now in the best of economic yeah. times yeah. to the degree where we used to rely on it as a proportion of revenue as a proportion of revenue um, that we used to rely on it when things were bad and you had to and it's the only tax you can go to it's the only tax you have within your own control so i was actually almost going to ask this question to everybody so do you think it's that we that revenue neutrality is we're stuck with it it's what we were asked to do um but let me ask you whether you think that um we should care that this tax of last resort is now running at a high level when uh, we don't know when the next recession is and whether we ought to take some cognizance of that. Is that what you meant by I looking at the longer term? Uh, to, uh, are, are you saying we should decrease the reliance on this if we possibly could? Yeah, I, I would disagree with that because the property tax is probably the tax of over 30 years in this state uh, and that you have the flexibility. I know we have the flexibility, right. but yeah. we're up it's historically right. at forty-five right. percent of our revenue. Yeah, no. but, if you're, but, but if you're, you know, consuming that and you're relying on income taxes and sales tax, one way that's necessarily entirely possible. So I just wanted to make sure. But I, I, but I, mean, I, I, do, I do. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, we could, well, well, we have started an <laughs> argument. Okay. Now, I mean, I think some of the the recent growth is, in fact, it's very unusual, and usually during the expansion, the property tax share decreases, um, and I think some of that has to do with some of the changes that were enacted with the business taxes and other parts that have coincided where with the decline uh, where in those, yeah, where those tax streams were sort of flat or declining rather than um, increasing. Um, I think there is a concern at the rate at which the property tax revenue has been growing and the spending that that has sort of allowed for the city um, to capture. And so I think that's from the, the fiscal efficiency and uh, point of view. I think we would say there's, there's a separate need to sort of rein in the growth of the budget, and some of that would be through, you know, you could possibly. I mean, you know, the, the, the city has been following this so-called frozen property yes. tax rate since the early 1990s. Right. Um, right. It's only had, you know, it, it, it was jumped <coughs> right after ni the 9-11 recession uh, by 18 and a half percent. 18.3. I rounded to 18 and a half. But the, um, and then it came down very slightly, it came down 7% for six months and went back up 7% uh, after 2008 recession, um, you know, and but that jump, that 18 and a half percent jump, we, you know, we now assume that that's that's the we're, we're treating that as the normal rate, even though it was enacted at a period of um, you know significant Crisis. fiscal stress, <coughs> where clearly the city is clearly past that fiscal stress, and you know I think there's th I don't know if this. Uh, is something that really can be addressed as tax reform, but as just fiscal policy. I think it's a it's a fair question. You know, why does the city keep adhering to the the uh, frozen rate? Because it takes a lot of decision making out of the pro out of the budget process. It used to be that the the tax rate was the last number in the budget. Right. You would you would know what the the city's estimate of revenues would be. The city council would adopt a spending uh, a budget that in a, uh, incorporated their prior their spending priorities, and then you set the property tax rate to bring it into balance. <laughs> it goes through the mechanics of working that way, but now, you know, what you're going to get from the property tax is known once the assessments are done, um, and that removes some pressure for for decision making. Um, so I you know I, and. To Carol's point about the, uh, you know, the fact that it's it's increasing as a share of the total uh, revenues, 
that's counter to what we what you see in earlier periods in the city. And granted, the mix of taxes available were, were differed, but the you know the share of the property tax would jump up at times of fiscal stress and then come back down, and it hasn't come back down, and we're growing along at about five and a half percent. The one other thing I I, I was going to bring up at some point if there had been an opportunity, yeah. Absolutely, but but that's sort of what government is supposed to <laughs> be about. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. <laughs> exactly, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. The the other point, you know, we we didn't. <laughs> we 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 didn't talk about the the uh, issues of the constitutional debt limit and the uh, operating limit. The city is actually very close to its maximum on the uh, operating limit. And that, again, how much you leave the property tax to keep growing uh, you know, become or can grow uh, becomes an issue there. And it's, uh, it's, it's also p a function of our prepayments, isn't it? Yes. 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 I mean, you know, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's not. Right, so that's a function of the large prepayments we're doing and the way we're, and the rather backhanded way we're handling reserves. Right. So that's a, it's not exactly up on our limit in the usual way, way of thinking of it. And, and that's yeah. caused by adherence to GAP. Yeah, yes. <laughs> adherence yes. to GAP, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right, I mean, exactly. adherence to GAP and not having an appropriate Perfect. rainy day fund. Yeah. yeah. That just exactly. proves that everything's connected to everything else. Yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. I, I would just add, changing the property tax rate is a kind of hard tool for cyclical management <laughs> because while lowering it is a very happy political day, raising it is not something mayors and, and speakers like to do, and they tend to be reluctant, I think, to lower it because they don't want to have to come back and raise it again. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think that we've said that programs like ICAP need to be reconsidered, but I think, you know, we have, the, those are as of right. I, discretionary benefits, I think, are a different matter. But I think that, you know, you would want to reconsider the, the structure of all of these um, as of right benefits that you have and whether or not they're still and then necessary. And any as of right benefit is pretty expensive. We're still spending more money than we want in the dollar general projection <laughs> to, to, from a fiscal perspective as to scale or, or break even. We haven't even talked about the debt service yet, talked about it yet. I think valuations in the city have jumped up way better than that in the last five months and the one that I was then saying that you were, you were still at. And I haven't seen sort of a success valuation cap or, you know, or other mechanism to limit that, I think is something that the commission could easily look at. Um, the other idea for, you know, specifically for 21A is to slowly reduce the dollar as well. We still have the development incentive is here. Um, if, you know, if we have a commission to, to reduce that incentive, both of those ideas are fair, right? Um, if you get more resources to, to address the dollar.
We have no excuse for not coming up with good recommendations. <laughs> what happens to them is still an open question. find other places too, but we may need to do that, you know, particularly in March and May, mm -hmm. you know, once we do budget here, we'll just like two more.